All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Delighted to see you all here today. My name is Maureen Conway. I am a Vice President for Policy Programs here at the Aspen Institute and an Executive Director of the Economic Opportunities Program. I am uh, delighted to welcome you to today's event, Quality Jobs for All, What Would It Take? Um, this event is uh, part of the Economic Opportunities Program Working in America series. In the Working in America series, we look at a variety of issues that low and moderate income working people are facing in the United States today, and we think about what are some of the ideas to um, help address those issues and to uh, help people connect to our economy, uh, move forward, and to, to thrive in today's um, changing world of work. Um, so in today's conversation, we're really excited to be hosting with the Urban Institute. Um, uh, the Urban Institute and the Aspen Institute have both been looking at this issue of quality jobs from sort of a couple of different vantage points. At the Aspen Institute, we've been looking at the issue of quality jobs and thinking about what can organizations do in their communities, what can workforce development organizations do, what can community development finance organizations do, what can businesses do, what can a whole range of actors do to try to think about what's the quality of jobs in our community and how, how, what's our role in sort of trying to um, elevate that quality of jobs. Um, the Urban Institute just released their, their catalyst brief as part of their Next 50 initiative on quality jobs, what will it take, and, and was looking at sort of what are some of the policy ideas that can address job quality issues, and, and sort of what's a research agenda around this question on quality jobs. So it seemed a great opportunity for us to sort of bring their research and our practice work together and uh, do the, you know, peanut butter and chocolate thing and uh, bring that all together and have a, have a conversation around what are the full range of ideas around quality jobs and what will it take. Um, we are, uh, I am uh, really happy to just um, quickly also thank our supporters for this event. Um, the, the Ford Foundation, the Walmart Foundation, and Prudential Financial have been supporting our Working in America series, and we're extremely grateful to them. Um, and I, in particular, I want to thank uh, the Ford Foundation and Prudential Financial, who have been also supporting our work with our Job Quality Fellows. Um, and I'm extra happy today to get to also uh, thank Prudential Financial for investing in sort of our next phase of work on job quality, really looking at what are some of the tools and supports that organizations need to, to think about building a job quality lens into their, into their practice, as well as their continued support for our Working in America series. So I'm very excited about that. Um, uh, I briefly just want to make a couple of announcements. We are um, live streaming this event, um, and so um, uh, and our hashtag for today is Talk Good Jobs. So I encourage you to use your phones to tweet things at, during this event, but I encourage you to also quiet your phones, please. Um, uh, and now I am very excited to be able to introduce Sarah Kay, who is Vice President for Corporate Social Responsibility. Um, at Prudential Financial, and uh, she's going to offer a little bit of opening remarks on their perspective on this question of quality jobs for all. What will it take? Uh, so thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone, um, and thank you so much for joining us today. As Maureen said, I am with Prudential Financial. Um, and so for some of you who may not know about our purpose story and how we were a purpose-driven enterprise even before that phrase got um, in vogue t today, it was really about our founder, John Dryden, over 140 years ago. He saw a big social need in the community where he saw that people from working class families didn't have the financial means to bury their loved ones. And so our first product was burial insurance that provided working class families to have financial security and the same opportunity that anyone else did. And that purpose still remains core to our DNA of how do we ensure that everyone has the opportunity to achieve financial security. But we know that opportunity is a decreasing every day. The wealth gap is increasing. And part of that is that part of the social safety net and the way that employers are providing jobs are lacking in terms of providing the right benefits, of making sure that there's health insurance, retirement, emergency savings products, college um, emergency assistance. And then in addition to the fact that many jobs today don't have the career advancement opportunities. And so we're really looking at the holistic picture of how do you make sure that, yes, people have jobs, people have the right skill sets, they're being connected to these jobs, but the jobs are also being provided with them with a pathway to integrity and dignity. 
I think some of us, we in this room, we have we work for employers that provide us with a whole host of benefits and allow us uh, professional learning opportunities. And how do we make sure that that's available to everybody so that there is a pathway to financial wellness? Um, and so we've been very lucky to partner with Maureen and her economic opportunities program to have two cohorts of job quality fellows, you'll meet a few of them today, who've really been taking a deep look both within their businesses, companies, organizations, policies, to really think about how do we make these shifts both in the labor market, with employers, with government officials, and really understanding what job quality means, and how do we incentivize and encourage employers to go down that pathway. So I hope you'll learn a lot today and ask a lot of questions, um, and thank you again. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. That was really terrific. I want to welcome our panelists to the to the stage now, um, and I will. Uh, I, you should have all of their. Um, yeah, yeah. Come on, up you go. Um, <laughs> uh, you're at that. Um, so, and I'm going to quickly give you a names to faces introduction of our of our panel. Um, uh, you have materials about them uh, on your seats, and, and it was on our website online. Um, okay, so to my far right, your far left, um, is E.J. Deong, columnist for the Washington Post. Um, next to E.J. is Demetra Nightingale, Institute Fellow at the Urban Institute. Uh, next to Demetra is Karen York, Executive Director of the Job Opportunities Task Force. Um, next to Karen is... Amanda Blondeau, Business Services Director at Northern Initiatives. And uh, right next to me is Rick Plimpton, who is CEO of Optimax Systems. Um, I want to thank E.J. Dion to, for being here today and for being willing to moderate this conversation. And E.J., I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. It's good of you all to come out today. And I am very honored and happy uh, to do this. I have a lot of respect for Aspen over a long period of time going all the way back to a project called the Domestic Strategy Group where we grappled with many of the issues that are on the table today and are part of this panel. Um, but I really said yes because I love Maureen and I love the work she has been doing in this area for such a long time and uh, anything I can do to support it I'm happy to do. So thank you Maureen for putting a lot of issues on the table uh, that really belong there. Um, let me just a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, my understanding is that people can actually send in questions online if they use that hashtag, that there are people watching this live stream. Again, the hashtag is TalkGoodJobs. And we will try to uh, include some of your questions um, in the conversation. Secondly, I'm going to go fairly early to the audience uh, for questions. I have a lot of things that I want to ask, and I might still come back myself. Uh, but uh, you know, we will have mics uh, going around the room, uh, and so please feel free to join us because there is not only a lot of expertise up here, but there's a lot of expertise in this room, and we would uh, appreciate your uh, contribution. Also, not just expertise, but concerned citizens. That's rather important at this moment in our history. I'm just going to make one point before... Um, I turn to the panel and why I think this work is so important. Um, one of the pieces on uh, the state of us, the state of our country, the state of our economy that I've read over the last few months that I have been pondering and had a great impact on me was by Gene uh, Sperling in Democracy Journal, which I should say I'm involved with, so I'm not completely unbiased, but I love this piece. It was Gene, as you know, worked for President Clinton, President Obama, um, and it was a piece on the economics of dignity. And I know some of my colleagues here want to talk about dignity um, as well. And I really do think that is a very good framework for thinking about the reforms, changes, and steps forward that we need to uh, take in our economy. Uh, dignity first in being able to provide for yourself and your family and having an ability to care for your family while you work. Um, secondly, dignity in having a chance to rise up, to have some control over your work life and some perspective on moving forward. Um, and third, dignity in the way you're treated at work, not simply as a cog in a machine or a disposable part uh, in some workforce, but actually as a human being. And I think all of our panelists actually have a lot to uh, 
say about almost everything they're going to talk about, I think, is in some sense encapsulated by that word dignity. And I hope that's a word we can be thinking a lot more about uh, between oh, over the next uh, couple of years as we have the debates going forward. I'd love to see a question of the Democratic debate about dignity. So anybody out there who has a role in that, please think about it. Um, Demetra has, uh, I'm going to start with uh, Demetra. The, the basic question that I pose to everyone is why focus on job quality? But uh, the Urban Institute, whose work I also admire, um, has done some really a good, a really good paper that Demetra is going to talk about putting questions on the table, ideas on the table uh, for how to move forward and really setting a research agenda. So I'll um, start with you and it's a great honor to be introducing you. Great, thank you very much. And thanks to all of you for being here. This is a great turnout and I know there are many more online. I've, the, the reason for that we're focusing on job quality, the Urban Institute has just uh, celebrated its uh, 50th anniversary. And in doing that, um, we've, we're now thinking about the next uh, couple of decades um, in terms of what kinds of research topics. So where are gaps in research that need to be done given the changes that we're seeing in society and government and in business? And so uh, the, uh, the, we have now the next 50 initiative, uh, although we're not necessarily going out all 50 years, but some of what the uh, research agenda that we're developing now will last for several decades. And uh, we're fortunate the City Foundation has funded us um, for this part of our Next 50 initiative, and we're uh, grateful for the support from the City Foundation. And um, there are, so far, there are uh, six or seven different uh, papers that have been produced. The Quality Jobs is one of them. And uh, one of my co-authors, Stephen Brown, is here today. Thank you, um, Stephen. Uh, the other two co-authors are Jenny Yang and Pam Lowpress, who are probably listening right now. Um, in addition to the job quality, and there'll be a theme here, uh, we have a paper on housing, climate adaptation, lifelong learning, financial well-being, structural racism, which Stephen has co-authored, um, safety and justice, and health. And if you think about it, uh, quality jobs or good jobs sort of fits a little bit in each of the, the uh, issues. So there's been a change in the nature of work and the arrangements between workers and employers, and the shift that we've seen is likely to continue. So for example, um, the, uh, there's no longer the same kind of a relationship between employers and employees as uh, there are more contractors, there are more so-called gig workers, there's more uh, franchising and uh, contracting out that businesses have in, in what uh, David Weil at uh, Brandeis calls the fissured economy with outsourcing and sort of mixed enterprises, mixed ownership of uh, enterprises. And uh, what that means is that the, the kinds of relationships that may have been the opportunity for good jobs in the past are changing themselves. And so there are fewer workers that have um, health and retirement than in the past through, through their work. Um, we've made some progress in terms of portable health benefits, but um, we still need more progress even in that area. But in addition to that, good jobs also means uh, retirement um, benefits, um, respect and engagement in the, in the workplace, as EJ mentioned, opportunities to advance and unemployment security that may not be security within one single job for a lifetime, but for um, employment security in the labor market and what exactly that, that means. And then uh, again, to have the uh, opportunity for uh, lifelong learning and continuing to adapt and change um, as the demands in the labor market also change. So that's why we're focusing on job quality and trying to understand sort of what, what do we already know, what still needs to be known, and what kinds of research continue to be needed in the next couple of decades. Thank you very much. Uh, Karen, right? I, or am I, am I screwing Karen. that up with my New England uh, axe, my Just back? Of, what? Just a little. Karen, Karen is better. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, please. Good afternoon. Um, and thank you, Maureen, and the Aspen Institute for having us here today. 
Um, I knew this was going to happen. Of course, I take time to draft all these wonderful notes, and then I go after this celebrity, and then everything just goes out the door, and, and all of my <laughs> thoughts are just like swirling around. Um, but very thankful um, to the Urban Institute in the recent report. Um, so I'm the executive director of the Job Opportunities Task Force, JOTF. It's a mouthful, so we like to use the acronym. And we're based in Baltimore City, but we're an independent statewide nonprofit. And our mission, very simply, is to help low-wage workers advance to high-wage jobs. And we seek to do that through the elimination of education and employment barriers to ensure that individuals have access to opportunities to increase their skills, their wages, and any job opportunities. But we're also very clear that when it comes to the low-wage worker category, that the low-wage worker category is not monolithic. And so you're going to find that there are certain segments of the low-wage worker constituency that are relegated to low-wage worker status due to whatever differences that may define them, right? Race, gender, culture, anything that could uh, require any ling linguistic um, challenges that may make it difficult for you to be able to move up um, in terms of your job opportunities. And so as a result of that, JOTF is very intentional about identifying those challenges and coming up with solutions to ensure that low wage workers can advance into high wage, good quality jobs. And so we have three strategies that we use to accomplish that program. We run a pre-apprenticeship construction training program, Project Jumpstart, um, of which I'll be able to talk about later, but we're training city residents where a significant number are coming in underemployed and, and lacking um, access to worker benefits and supports or just employment in general, and training them in construction trades, carpentry, electrical, and plumbing, and then moving them along the pathway to apprenticeship and then journeymanship and higher wages, of course. But training can't fix everything, and so the experiences of Project Jumpstart then inform and influence our policy agenda. And so our policy agenda, which is focused at both the state and the local level, runs the gamut. We're talking worker supports and benefits, right? Minimum wage increases, paid sick leave, family leave. We're talking about transportation, access to affordable, efficient transportation options. Um, we're talking about affordable um, and accessible access to post-secondary education, right? Adult education, skills training, occupational licensing. Sometimes we don't like to couch occupational licensing within um, adult education, but it is, okay? Um, the impacts of incarceration on working families, right? And the inability that many of those workers have to actually move up. A whole host of issues, unemployment insurance for you know, new work labor entrants, um, and the like, a whole host of issues that really focus on the challenges that are relegating individuals to low wage worker status, and then what are the solutions that need to be um, identified and created um, and passed at either the state um, or the local level to advance this and to ensure that it's possible. And then our third strategy is research in public education, where we're collecting data, we're identifying best practices from other states and localities that really support this idea of moving low wage workers to high wage jobs. And so this, the idea of job quality is built into everything that we do at the Job Opportunities Task Force because we understand that for low wage workers, they are going to be the least likely to have access to quality jobs. They're going to be the least likely to have access to the higher wages right off the jump, be able to have access to sick leave and family leave and all of these supports and benefits that on the front end may not seem as if they're employment related, but they are directly related to someone's ability to secure and maintain employment. And me personally, I know it. I I feel it, not just as executive director of the Job Opportunities Task Force, but as a young African-American female born and raised in Baltimore City, right? Currently, right now, I live in Southwest Baltimore. This is an area where it's surrounded by Camden Yards and Raven Stadium, and you're familiar with it, right? Downtown. Yet the medium household income, the median household income in my community is 10,500. 40% of my neighbors have a GED or high school diploma. So this idea, and if they are able to get employment, they are terrified to call in sick. That's not just a loss of a paycheck, that's a loss of a job. And so it's real out here for folks. It's real in the community in which I am living in. But it's also real for me as an employee of the Job Opportunities Task Force. I remember before I was executive director, um, I was director of policy. And it was during our 90-day session. I don't know why in Maryland they lump it all together in 90 days. <laughs> where we only have 90 days to pass laws. And so, of course, you get super, super stressed. And I got hit with walking pneumonia and bronchitis at the same time. And so, of course, the doctor's you know, diagnosis is, this is what it is, you just need to lay for a month. The fact that my employer allowed me to just lay for a month and get better and then come back while still getting paid and being able to come back to a job, 
That is so important to a worker. That means you're going to come back even more excited to produce, excited to invest. So, and that's exactly what I did. I came back from my illness getting on everyone's nerves because I was so excited to come back and give back. And so when it comes to job quality, for me personally, it is something that whenever we're talking about workforce development, whenever you're talking about moving a worker from point A to B to Z, you can't talk about just training or skill credentialing, or you can't even just simply talk about wages. You have to talk about opportunities, access for opportunities for advancement and mobility, fair hiring practices, worker supports and benefits. I mean, the list runs on and on and on. But job quality is how can we ensure that folks are going to have access to stability and security for themselves and for their families. Uh, Karen, I want to give you a warning because I want to ask you a question. I just had a fantasy here, which is I'd love a president, we won't name that president, to unless you wanted to run for governor of Maryland where I vote, which I think would be great. But failing that, um, a president asked you to be secretary of labor. I'm going to come back and ask you this so you can think about it. Oh, dear. I'd love to think, uh, for you to think about you know, can you sort of think of two, three, four things that you really would want to change about federal policy yeah. out of the box uh, if you had that opportunity? And the, the president you served said, you're going to run this. I'm going to take your ideas. What, what do I do? So keep that in your head while I go to the rest of the panel, uh, Madam Secretary uh, or Governor. Um, the, um, Amanda um, works with small businesses uh, she is from, I learned, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and I don't know how many of you have been up there. I think the UP is one of the most interesting places uh, in, uh, in America. But with the kind of work she does is with employers who don't necessarily have scads of resources to do, this, do the sorts of things that everyone in this room would like employers to do uh, with workers. So why don't you uh, talk, uh, talk about that? It's really good of you to come today. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks. give my love to the UP. I will. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so yeah, my name is Amanda Blondo. I'm the Director of Business Services at Northern Initiatives. We're a community development financial institution. And our main office is, is in Marquette, which is on the shores of Lake Superior. Um, and we were originally started by Northern Michigan University because they saw that there was a lot of out-migration. So people were getting careers and they were leaving the area because there wasn't jobs. And so they started Northern Initiatives thinking about being able, entrepreneurship is a path to quality jobs. Uh, and in 1992, we became our, a private nonprofit. And since then, we have helped uh, over a thousand businesses to create over five thousand jobs. So it's still, you know, these are small, small businesses. We're thinking about five jobs for these small businesses, but that's also a family that's able to stay in the area. And the reason why a lot of the people live in the Upper Peninsula and in Northern Michigan is because they love it there. Um, they didn't move there because this job brought them to the area. Sometimes that's a case where one of the spouses got a job and then there's a trailing spouse, but it's really because they wanted to be in that community. And so entrepreneurship is this key way that they can create a quality job for themselves. Most of our territory is rural. We now are serving throughout Michigan and the border counties of Wisconsin. But what we do is we provide money and know-how to small businesses that are looking to start and grow in the communities. And so these are businesses that don't have access to traditional financing. They can't go to a bank. They've already been turned down by a bank. And they have this idea, they have this passion that they want to start a business. And so we provide them with financing. But then the other part is, is we couple that with knowledge. And so you know, as you're already hearing from the other panelists, it's really thinking about what are those supports that we can provide to the small business owners, to individuals, so that they can be successful. And in the end, they want to be able to provide health insurance to provide a retirement, but it's a continuum. So at first, it might just be about, I want to be able to raise the jobs, and I want to have flexible schedules, um, predictable scheduling, but also if somebody needs to leave because their, their kid has, their, you know, has a soccer game or other things, so that they have that ability to have flexibility. But in the end, after a few years, then they're able to 
offer retirement. We have um, we work with a lot of restaurants, um, which a lot of community development financial institutions do because they're riskier. Banks don't want to fund them. Um, and we have a local restaurant. It's a Tex-Mex restaurant that has grown into three different locations over the last um, over 10 years. They now have retirement for their employees. They now have job advancement opportunities. They also have health benefits. And so it's become this place that people do not leave. They, they want to go there. They have pride in what they do. Um, but it's also, when we think about job quality, we don't want to just say there's a good job or there's a bad job. Because I think it's also about where are people at in the continuum. And our, our goal is really to help to provide resources so that they can continue to grow, to be sustainable, and to add more of those those parameters that we all think of when you think of a really good job. Um, since I'm creating an administration here, <laughs> oh boy. Demetra will be the uh, director of domestic policy in the White House or head of the uh, Council of Economic Advisors. Like uh, imagine, and I'm going to come back on this also, um, um, imagine that you are Secretary of Commerce, or I guess Elizabeth Warren wants it to be Secretary of Economic Development. Um, a lot of our conversation um, when we talk about small business is usually oriented around small businesses saying we're regulated too much, you ask too much of us, and all of that. I'd like to flip the script because you work with them. And by the way, you should tell us the name of that restaurant so we can all patronize it yes. uh, when we're up there. Um, but flip the script and say, what are the things government needs to do affirmatively or could do affirmatively to support job quality um, and at the same time I'll let these businesses succeed? Just keep that okay. in your head. Um, and I'm going to have you come back and then sort of make sense of the agenda we are uh, creating here. And um, I'm actually thinking of making Rick the head of NASA um, and I'll, because um, Rick is the CEO of Optimax Systems, which does, uh, I don't understand it fully, but it does really cool stuff with microscopes and, and um, uh, what, do you, what do you call the? Optics. Optics. Yeah. And so he will talk about job quality, not only here on Earth, but also on the moon and Mars. But welcome, uh, welcome Rick, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, at Optimax, we make precision optics for research and industry. We're based out of Rochester, New York, uh, founded in 1991. So in a small way, we're kind of carrying on the legacy of Kodak and Bausch and & Lomb, which were both uh, hometown Rochester, New York. Um, we're a small business. Uh, in 30 years, we've grown to about 400 people. Um, 300 of the people that we have are technicians and engineers, and then we've got about 100 support people. Um, we have a very unique culture. One, one of the things that I didn't realize is how special our company is. When you own a business, you really have a lot of flexibility to structure your benefits and your culture in a way that suits your desires in, in the world and how you want to improve the world. Um, and I didn't know how special that was until I joined this uh, fellowship here at the Aspen Institute. <laughs> Um, so I'm here today to share a few, few things about our company, and I'm happy to talk more with anybody that's interested in learning more about Optimax. Um, but it's, it all starts with a fundamental belief. My business partner and I both grew up blue collar, and we know that most people wake up in the morning and they want to create value. So at Optimax, we try to create a place where they can come in and do what they know needs to get done to create value for our customers. And that means giving them the training, the resources, and the information that they need to make good decisions. And if you, if you kind of take a lofty look at it, think back 200 years ago, the people in power were people that had education and means. And most of the common people, the workers, were treated like legalized slavery. The world has changed today. Today, everyone can be educated. Everyone has access to information. If you don't know something, you just look it up on your cell phone, and two minutes later, you know what it is. Right. You know, it's, it's just a very different world. And so I have, a, I have a belief that we need to change our compensation uh, strategies to match the wealth creation that's given today. And, and uh, at Optimax, we're trying to do that. So I'll give you a couple examples. Um, we, everyone that comes into Optimax, we try to make sure they're being paid a fair wage. Any employee that doesn't feel that they're getting the wage that they deserve, they can write a one-pager to HR department and 
they'll get an opportunity to get that raise that they're looking for. Um, HR will get some of their peers together, sit down with them and have a conversation. Now, if they want to make a million dollars a year, I don't think we've got that job for them. <laughs> but, you know, if, the, if they're making 40 or 50,000 a year and they want to make 80,000, we can have a conversation about career path. If they, if they think that they, need, they, des, they deserve an extra, say, dollar an hour raise, uh, maybe they're right and we should have that discussion and they, and they, they may get that. Um, another thing that we do every month, we, we look at how much money, you know, what our revenue was last month, what our expenses were, and how much money we made. And we take 25% of the profit and we share it with our workforce. Mm -hmm. and, and the beauty of that is that the first day of the new month, all the metrics are back at zero and we're working hard as a team. So we try to make sure everyone's getting paid a fair wage for the role that they play in the team. And then when we beat the market as a team, that's when we make profit mm -hmm. and we share that with the workforce. So those are just a couple of things to kind of tee things up. Oh. Wow. I want to say that after you, as on your way out the door, there will be applications to work for Optimax. I think we all want to join that company. Could I just come right back at you first, sure. if I could, which is you have a company of 400 employees, yeah. you say. Basically, two questions. At what point, uh, maybe never, at what point would what you do become more difficult if you tripled or quadrupled in size? In other words, what is it? Is there something about having a company this size that actually makes it easier to do what you do? And are there any lessons for larger companies? And the second thing is, I, you know, in we were talking about this before uh, we came down. Um, there are obviously highly, highly skilled workers whom other people can hire away from you whom you really want to keep, and those kind of workers tend to be treated pretty well in the workforce. There are other workers with fewer formal skills, even though you're training them up, who are obviously don't have the same bargaining power out in uh, the world. Could you talk about how uh, those folks can get treated better in the economy? So there are two things, the size of your company and how that contributes yeah. to this culture and, and the sort of the, the workers who don't have as many marketable skills yeah, going so, in. So let me take that in reverse order. Yeah. Let's talk training first or workforce development and then I'll talk about as a company gets larger. So with regard to workforce development, we've got like 12 different irons in the fire. There's no single solution for how to build workforce. In the past year, we've hired over 100 new employees. We're, we're at, we average 20% revenue growth per year, and we're still on that path, which is really mind-boggling given how big we are now. Um, but with regard to workforce development, we have a, we have a belief that um, if you train people appropriately, they'll, they'll be able to create higher value. So we offer $5,000 to, to each employee each year for higher education. So that's a tuition reimbursement. Uh, many of our employees take advantage of that. Um, we're actually looking at, we're doing an expansion right now that'll double the size of our facility and we're looking at creating a, a synchronous learning room. So it'll have cameras and microphones like this room does. That'll be, that'll be connected to a local community college. So our employees don't have to leave the building to take classes. Um, that'll be a really nice perk. Uh, we also run a lot of, uh, there's on the job training of course, there's leadership training courses. We have a program we call Read to Lead where we'll take a a book and read it a few chapters at a time, get together as a group and just process what the book is about. So the book's a way to tee up conversation and talk about how you know, we can be more effective or work more uh, or strengthen teams within the company. Um, so, there, so, so there are many things that we're doing to help our company grow. I could talk for the next 15 minutes about our peer review <laughs> process. We, 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 make, we try to make sure every employee has a learning plan. Um, so that it's each year they're getting stronger and stronger as an employee and growing as an individual and taking pride in their work. Um, but let me, let me turn to the conversation of as the company gets bigger, how do we deal with that? So I, we used to think that, you know, when we were smaller, like 10, 20, 30 people, if we get to this size, everything will be okay. You know, like if we get to 100 people, everything will be okay. But what we found is every time we got a little bigger, the culture had to shift. And so we, we tend to think of... Um, Optimax is a cultural journey now. And we're just, we're, we're like, actually, I feel like we're still just getting started because for the past couple of years, I've been working on our succession plan. And one of the things that I want to do, the, the company's owned by myself and my business partner, 100%. But we want to take all the voting shares and put it into a perpetual trust where nobody, nobody can ever 
sell the company. And it kind of gets rid of the shareholder issues. So in the future, Optimax can operate as a for-profit business, providing value in the marketplace, and the wealth generation gets shared with the workforce and is used for growing the company. It, 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 some of the money may be used to invest in innovation or in training, but it's not getting sucked out of the company by uh, shareholders that may or may not have anything to do with the company. And it's just another way that we're trying to um, create a corporate structure that will withstand the test of time. And for decades and decades, Optimax can continue to grow and, and build value in the marketplace. I, you just said something so interesting. I, I, I want to get back to the other panelists, but uh, get rid of the shareholder issues. Um, and it, it's, I've been, as a lot of people, I think, in this room have been, the notion that became popular in the 80s that shareholder value was the one and only thing uh, that really mattered. And uh, Joe Biden actually mentioned that in his Iowa trip yesterday. Steve Perlstein, my Washington Post colleague, has written very powerfully on this question. Boy, I'd love you to come uh, put that. What do we do about that? Because it really suggests that the dominant system of financing companies in our country is deeply flawed, just the way you said that. And uh, um, do you want to hold on that and think about that? Yeah. Or, uh, be well, let me just add that what we're doing is not right for every company, for sure. All right. But it, it may be right for a lot of small to mid-sized companies that if they follow the path that we're going down, and, and we're creating a new corporate structure that doesn't exist in America today. So let me just put that out there. It's, mm -hmm. This is not something that's been done for a while. It's something that we're working with a team to create. Um, but it's a way that you can strengthen uh, companies and communities uh, where the wealth that's generated goes to the employees and their families and, and out into the community. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'd love to come back to that. Um, I am going to exercise my control as a worker here because Maureen wrote a wonderful question, uh, which she called a lightning round question. Before I go back to the ones I asked, she wanted me to do it later, but with uh, the permission of my uh, uh, temporary employer here. I guess if I, 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 I guess I can walk away. I'm not paid today, so. Uh, but you know, in cooperation with uh, Maureen, I just want to ask. It was such a great question that I just want to put it on the table and go right down mm -hmm. uh, the line. I'm just going to read Maureen's question. Often our conversation around jobs is full of fear, fears that there won't be enough jobs, or there won't be any good jobs, or the good jobs will only be available to people with specific skills, but it's hard to know what those skills are. And all too often, people feel that this problem of quality jobs is too difficult and they can't do anything about it. And so here's the hard part. What is one thing, one thing you would tell people, policymakers, community leaders, business leaders, that they can do to support quality jobs? May I start with you, since you've just written the report on this, my, the, uh, the <laughs> domestic policy uh, chief in my uh, notional administration? <laughs> okay, and I would add one group that's not in, in your list there, which would be the workers themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, that they, as well as uh, government and businesses, also have, have a role to play and the families of, um, of children and young people. And, and it, it's really to... Um, prepare for jobs, not only the jobs that exist today, but jobs that will exist in the future, and invest the time uh, and money that uh, is required to get the education and training, to have some optimism and hope that they will be able um, to do that. And most important, I think, is to commit, um, even, even those who have a college degree, it's not over. You have to commit to lifelong learning and retraining to be able to be flexible, nimble, and adapt to future changes. So I would add um, the workers themselves to that. And, and uh, businesses and government need to be able to support that kind of um, hope and trajectory. Could I come back on that? I, I, th we've all been thinking about this very issue and the need to train and retrain and all the rest. And I've thought a lot about the 2016 campaign uh, and I, I had this notion, and I grew up in a blue-collar town up in uh, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, me too. Yeah. Oh, they, 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 um, so That's we, why we, we get share. along. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the when um, you know policy folks, uh, progressives or middle-of-the-road people, go to a fifty-year-old person 
Uh, and all these policy folks are college educated. They're probably overeducated. I, you know, they've spent forever in school. They love school. Uh, and they go to a guy, and, and I use guy consciously both for what's happening in politics, but also because the challenge to the, the disappearance of blue collar work, I think, has hit guys in particular and created particular resentments among guys. Well, we could say women too. Uh, and you go up to that person and say, at age 50, you made a bargain with the economy. You thought that if you worked hard, uh, you would make enough money to support your family and have a decent retirement. And then, bang, the job disappears. Mm -hmm. And so this educated person comes to you and says, essentially, you got to be just like me. you got to go back to school and all the rest. And then along came Donald Trump, who says, I'm going to bring back the jobs in the mines. I'm going to bring back the jobs in the factories. So my theory on this has been that a lot of the voters who responded to that um, did not really believe he was going to bring job back the jobs in the mines or the factories. But the second sounds more respectful to that person of their own understanding of the situation they're in than the first. And we will, we'll put aside arguments, other reasons Donald Trump won. I, I don't want to get into that today. That's not our purpose. Uh, but you know, I've thought of that conversation then right. that um, I, I liked Rick Cordray, ran for governor of Ohio, had a formulation I liked a lot, even though it didn't help him get elected, um, where uh, I thought it was more respectful. It was, you shouldn't have to go to college to join the middle class, mm -hmm. which I at least felt was the beginning of some respect for the worldview of the person sitting there. I'm curious what your thoughts right. are on that, and then we'll turn to our Secretary of Labor or well, my future governor, whichever yeah. she picks. I, I think this is where... Rick's comments and my thinking sort of come together that we need to shift sort of the paradigm so that um, work itself is a continuous learning environment. And he talked about having a, a learning plan for each employee every year, which I'm assuming means from the lowest to the highest level person in the, in the company. And that if it's a continuous um, part of the culture, it's not sort of a shock um, to the, the system that requires you to either stop a job and go back to school, but you're already adapted and developing the skills that you go along. So it is a, it is a paradigm shift in the workplace as well to continuously provide opportunities for um, continuous learning and relearning. Yeah, my, the theory of my question is partly that I think the argument that you just made, which is clearly right, I mean, there's no way we can get around that. Um, it sounds more sensible to a 30-year-old uh, who is now acclimated to this world that we're in than it does to a 50-year-old who made a particular deal or thought they had a particular deal with the economy. But, but if that deal from the time they were 30 had incorporated continuous learning, mm -hmm. there wouldn't be sort of an all of a sudden shock mm -hmm. to their system because they would already be adapting year by year. So That's, it wouldn't be something new. That's that's a very good point. Uh, you, you, you'll be, do an excellent job in the White House, please. Uh, why don't you, you know, I have the one, and then I asked you for a bit more of an agenda. So do the one, but then do the rest. Oh, I totally want. was going to flow into my, now that I'm Madam Secretary, and any board members that are watching, I expect to be <laughs> Madam Secretary. Board no, Mr. He said it. He yeah. said it. He said it. Um, so, I mean, that's a... That's a very difficult um, question to answer, you know, just one, and I struggled with it, right? Just one response, which is why I'm so happy we're going to connect it to me being Labor Secretary so I could tie it to my two to three, four, so I got yeah, five. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. I like it when people embrace my ideas. It doesn't always happen. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, of course, in listening, um, in listening and thinking about the question, it really takes me back to, you know, what I mentioned earlier and kind of the driving um, force and the primary theme uh, in our work. And it's this idea that, again, the worker, the student, not monolithic, right? So even when we talk about um, <clears throat> things like access to education, right? Um, and Rick and I are in a fellowship. We're in the fellowship together, so we have these conversations all the time um, where, you know, we may think that access to education is available for everyone, but it's not, right? Because there are certain constituencies that it's not so easy to access education. So one of the things that if I were um, what am I, Secretary of Labor, Governor? I'm going to go with Secretary of Labor. Yeah, for right that's now. good. Okay. So <laughs> if I were Secretary of Labor, you know, one of the things that I, you know, were well, two of the things that I would push 
um, that focus kind of on the education and access to affordable, affordable education. Um, is, um, of course, investing more in adult education and skill training and the like. But we cannot focus solely on things like apprenticeships and, of course, my other piece is pre-apprenticeships. Right? We're hearing a lot about apprenticeships, but we're not talking about that piece that's yeah. needed to actually facilitate someone's success while in the apprenticeship. Um, we also have to talk about college affordability. And I'm not just talking about four-year colleges. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, some people cannot afford to access community college. Right? And so if we are highlighting community colleges as the way for you to be able to obtain additional credentialing and, and licensing opportunities, yet it's about four to $500 for a three to four credit class, and you don't have it because you need that to access higher wages, but you don't have those wages yet, then that educational opportunity is actually inaccessible to you. And so we have to start thinking more creatively and intentionally about how we are ensuring that post-secondary educational opportunities are affordable and accessible to workers, right? Because the worker and the student, all over the place now, right? We're talking about justice-involved individuals, first generation. We're talking about individuals aging out of foster care, like all of these different constituencies that you know have different challenges that's gonna impact their ability to access all of these many things. Um, a big piece of my work is eliminating educational and employment barriers for formerly incarcerated individuals, right? They're coming home if they were not sentenced to life, and so how can we ensure that they're put on a pathway to good jobs? So these are things like ensuring access to Pell Grants while behind the fence. Ban the box on college applications, right? We're totally okay with educating folks behind the fence, but when they come out, it's like, wait, you wanna go to college? That's what we wanna do around here? Occupational licensing, again, the majority of jobs nowadays require some type of professional license. But in Maryland, we're, we have the most burdensome, restrictive um, criteria in the nation. And if you need that in order to be able to access these jobs, you were in jail 15 years, you were the jailhouse barber, now you get out and you can't get a cosmetology license, right? That's impacting your economic livelihood. Public assistance, right? Federal policies that jeopardize someone's ability to access public assistance because of a drug conviction. This is directly tied to the 1996 Welfare Reform Act, right? Where if you were found found guilty of uh, possession of, um, of drugs and it was, you know, a felony, then you were ineligible to receive food stamps and, and um, temporary cash assistance, all of these things that are needed to facilitate you getting back on your feet um, upon reentry. And who can forget paid leave and sick leave and family leave? No one knows when they're gonna get sick, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't know how long you're gonna get sick for, but your paycheck or your job security should not be jeopardized by something that's gonna happen to anyone. And so when we think about job quality and all the things that need to happen, there's a ton that needs to happen at the federal level, of course, but a lot of the action is happening at the state and local level. And I know I'll talk about this later, but I would love to you know, just talk about how even at the state and local level, you're seeing a lot of the contention around um, job quality. And it's not just with the Republicans, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of times, you're spending time trying to convince moderate Democrats of why they should support things like paid sick leave. It took six years to pass paid sick leave in Maryland, blue Maryland, which is really purple, right? And so how can we start talking about things like leave, supports, and benefits? Because when it comes down to job quality, you can't talk about job quality without talking about access. Because certain folks are only going to be able to access certain jobs because of who they are or what they look like or where they were born. I was shooting too low. Thank you, President York. That, <laughs> yeah. was, uh, that was awesome. Um, Amanda, I wanted to sort of link the one thing question with my <clears throat> other question about, um, you know, the we, we talk about the regulatory side often with small business. We don't talk about places where actually government can take burdens off small business uh, to meet needs and help them make a profit. If you could, sort of the one thing you would do mm -hmm. and then some other, and then I'll, I'm gonna go to Rick and then I'm gonna go to the audience for uh, uh, questions. And also if uh, people who might be watching this online, uh, some, Dan will get me those, right? If somebody will get me uh, your questions. We've got some? Uh, no, okay, good. Um, <laughs> All right, um, it is always hard to think about the one. And this is going to sound cliche, but it's also so true, is when we buy from locally owned businesses. Mm -hmm. So not just they have a storefront there, but they're owned somewhere else. It's about who actually lives in that community. And, and there's tons of data around this, but if you look at um, 
So we have an organization in Grand Rapids called Local First, and they do a lot of education around it, and they've got good for Grand Rapids. They've done a lot of work, and the studies that they've found, so if you spend $100 at a locally owned business, $68 stays within that community. If you spend $100 at a non-locally owned business, $43. So yes, they're still in that community, they're still providing jobs, but it goes even deeper to be able to make sure that we have a stronger community. And then also, um, if they are making more money, they can provide more benefits to their, to their employees too. So that's, I know we say buy local, but when you really think about buying local, do you know that owner? Does that owner live in that community? And those are the jobs too that, um, so in the Great Recession, you know, Northern Initiatives, we were working with a lot of small businesses that, that were really affected, but they held on to their employees and their bottom line was affected from that, but it's because they cared about their communities. Um, so just wanted to drive that, that point down. A lot of, you know, the things that I think about is, is, is what Karen had brought up as well and the other, um, and Demetra too, and just thinking about um, education and so I, the community that I grew up in is a very small town. We are a K through 12 school and it's primarily mining jobs. And you know, everybody worked, went to the mines. You graduated, you went to the mines. Um, but that's obviously had a lot of volatility. There still is a lot of mining jobs. It's shifted now to logging, natural resources, and, and we've continued to diversify by allowing this opportunity um, for entrepreneurship. And so when we had the recession, they said, well, just go to school for a year. It's free schooling, but which is great because we want to have free schooling, but there's also the, it, the, the, um, the needs of having to be able to bring money home to have you know, food on the table, to be able to pay your bills was also something that we really needed to think about. So it's about how do we get a little bit more creative about providing education uh, where people need it and, and what fits their lives too. Uh, you know, this is obviously a debate that we've been talking about for a long time, but if we could just all have health care, that would also be just, <laughs> that would just be great. Um, just going just gonna to say that um, so that the small business owner is not trying to figure out how do I provide that both for my family because this is where I wanted to stay, this is what I want to do, I wanted to create jobs in that community um, and how they can do it for their employees. But if that was just a given, then I think that would just raise the level right away. Right. Thank you so much for that. I, I, I mean, one, just real quick, and then I want to go to Rick and then the audience. Um, the, it seems to be, there's been a lot of talk of rethinking the entire unemployment uh, uh -huh. system that we have, which uh -huh. is inadequate in many ways, uh, but one of them is that it really doesn't have a very strong link to helping people get the next job. Um, do you have thoughts on that, you know, how the unemployment system might be linked? Because you raised it perfectly, which is, yeah, you can go back to school, but if you can't feed your family, this is yeah. rather problematic. Yeah. You can't feed them A's, you know? I right. Mean, yeah, the, <laughs> well, yeah, and you saw that a lot when, you know, there was a lot of high unemployment where you could get a job, but if I took that job, mm -hmm. then I couldn't get benefits yep. anymore. Yep. Um, and I'm also seeing it, too, from the small business owners thinking about, do I have, do I contract? Hmm. And, and so this is a little bit different perspective, but thinking about the, the cost of having an employee, which they, they believe in, but also weighing that with, if you have a contractor, then the cost is different. Um, most people want to have, you know, have the employees to be able to provide that. That's one of their missions. But I think also um, some of that employment piece too. Mm -hmm. And also, um, we're seeing where some people, you know, don't don't take that job. Or can I, can I yeah. add? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add um, a, a couple of things on unemployment insurance because there are some changes that are happening, and there are some demos that have been started, and hopefully will continue. But one is that uh, Congress uh, last year and the year before, and I, maybe this year too, will um, appropriate several hundreds of millions of dollars a year for reemployment services for people receiving unemployment insurance. So that 
is a step in the right direction. Yeah. How did that sneak in? Well, I think that, <laughs> I think that uh, businesses, and, and it's sort of a bipartisan um, support for, um, for doing that, and it sort of restores some of the funding in those employment programs that have been reduced over the past two decades. The second thing is that there are um, demos and there's been some piloting around job sharing, which is more common in other countries yeah. Yeah. Where, um, where rather than laying people off, um, there may be a way to share the jobs, and so you could you could have some government supplement to those wages. So yeah. um, employers and businesses are like right now they're not very interested in it, but once the um, the business cycle changes and unemployment increases, you see an uptake in the, the interest for that, and the the laws are there. And then the third thing that could make a big difference, and you alluded to this a little bit, is to expand eligibility for unemployment insurance to include part-time workers mm -hmm. and contract workers and self-employed sure. workers who right now are not eligible for unemployment. That's a big one. That Thank you. Um, Rick, you are one idea and other ideas as well, but the one, and then we'll open it up. All right, um, so I think the, the question was about how to change policy, right? And I don't, I don't have the patience for that. So I think there's a lot of things <laughs> small business owners can do to help make the world a better place. So I'll just give you a couple of But we more need examples. you involved. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And, and I do get involved. That's, why, that's, that's why Maureen brought you here. You but know, but, but I want to give you a couple this. more examples here. So Karen mentioned paid leave. And so at Optimax, we have really good insurance, short-term, long-term disability, that type of thing for our employees. But we created a policy where if an employee has a parent that needs, they need to take time off to help a parent or a sick child, um, other employees can donate personal time off to that employee so that they can you know, take an extended time away from work and, uh, and not miss out on their paycheck. Um, some of the other things we do, we have a, a wellness program that's really good, and that's been like raising the bar in terms of, it, it's, a, it's about two years old now, and it's been raising the bar in terms of supporting our employees and make sure they have a healthy lifestyle. At work, we, we give out free health food, like yogurt and fruit and granola bars, so people you know, can grab a snack when, if they're getting hungry and they don't have to, to uh, miss out on, on good nutrition. Um, and what, and here's, here's a policy we came up with a few years ago that I really like. Many workers, as they get on in their career, their, you know, their wages kind of plateau. Mm -hmm. And so if they've been with us 20 or 25 years, they're in that phase of life where their wages aren't increasing very much. Maybe they're still learning. But for sure, they're a core member of the team, and they're providing great value every day. And so we created a policy where at their 25th anniversary, we give them a block of phantom stock options. And the idea is it's a way to reinvigorate them to make sure that they're leveraging their expertise and their know-how with the younger people and mentoring people to, to grow the company. And to the extent that we can grow company, these phantom stocks mature in five years. To, to the extent that we can grow corporate value over the next five years, they get a, an additional reward. Oh, and I think well, it's a really good. beautiful way to help older employees make sure they're really engaged every day at work. So this president can urge you to become the CEO of 100 companies oh, in yes. America when she is uh, president. I said to Maureen, I wanted to give her the first question. So I, I will if, uh, um, uh, let's, uh, let's bring the mic to you. And then maybe we can go online uh, and then we'll go here. Um, well, I guess. Um, I guess the, the question that I, this has been, so thank you all. I am unsurprised that this has been a fabulous conversation because I love talking with all of you. Um, and uh, I, I'm, the thing I've, I keep reflecting on as we think about this is sort of, you know, we're, we're kind of talking with Rick about sort of what he does in his company and we're kind of talking about what policies could be. And I'm trying to think about how do we think about these things together, right? Like, so as you think about, you know, what, how should we be sort of describing what's the what's the public private role um, in in sort of in you know helping people have sort of basic economic stability? A lot of our policies we say we want to encourage people to work, and we do, um, but work isn't working for everybody. And how do we how do we think about that? So I'm thinking about the thing people in Karen's neighborhood who are only making ten thousand four hundred. So all those things that we want them to do in terms of advancing their education and taking care of their families, they just 
can't do it, right? So, mm -hmm. so, so they're so it's not only them who are not set up for success, but it's their kids who are not set up for success. Mm -hmm. It's their communities who aren't set up for success because the tax base doesn't support decent schools in those communities. So, how do we think about like more broadly, as we're asking people to work and as we're asking companies to do certain things? What should be this conversation between business and government about? What are our respective roles, right? So we don't have people trying to win the boss lottery so that they have paid leave. <laughs> Do you want to hear from all of us, or? Uh, yeah. Why don't a couple of you think about it and then get some questions from folks from the audience? Okay. okay. Oh yeah. Um, well, let's see. Do you want to? Do you have a mic there? Yeah. Sure. Uh, two questions from the from people on Twitter. Uh, thank you, for everyone who sent them in. Uh, the first is, what's the role of organized labor or unions in, in this space? Uh, that hasn't been addressed yet, so looking for to find out what, uh, what role they can play in this. And the other is, uh, what do people think about federal job guarantees or the uh, Jobs for All Act? What, uh, okay. you know, what do you think, is, is that a solution to this, or uh, is, is that part of a set of solutions? Okay. Thank you. Those are great. Yep. Those are excellent questions. You want to start, yep. and we can we can mold those three mm -hmm. uh, together. Um, your, uh, if your town was like mine, it was also a union town. Yes, yes. it was, yeah. and a union house. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, we address both of these in our uh, paper, and we urge all of you to look at the paper. You can um, download it, and if you've got comments and you want to have just dialogue, give the, you can uh, um, give the address. Uh, well, it's at the Urban Institute. Yeah, urbaninstitute.org, and there's a little thing on the right that says Next 50. You just go there, and mm -hmm. you'll you'll find it. Um, but certainly, uh, unionization has been declining. But when you look at sort of the research on um, jobs that pay well for people who do not have college, the majority of those good jobs for people without college are unionized. Yeah. So there's still an important role. For um, for unions, but that said, the reality is that um, that a lot of businesses are are not unionized, and so there, what's important we think is um, positive engagement models to engage um, workers, which Rick had talked about. So there there's a role for both unions and non union union engagement policies that can go um, hand in hand. And uh, meanwhile, unions, of course, are trying to expand their, um, their membership into some of the um, non-traditional kinds of employment. And you're even seeing that in some of the gig and contractor jobs as well. So I think it's a parallel thing. It's sort of worker engagement in the workplace and, um, and continued support for um, organized unions. And then the uh, federal job guarantees. Um, we at the Urban Institute are beginning to do some uh, statistical micro simulation analysis to look at sort of what the um, what the size of those guarantees would uh, imply for different population groups and what the total overall cost is and you, you have to be a little careful with subsidized jobs and job guarantees but um, many of us including myself I feel like that's an important part of what public policy has to do because the reality of the job market is not everybody in Karen's neighborhood is going to be able to get a good job. And so we have to have a good balance of uh, wage subsidies, job subsidies, and uh, consideration of uh, business profits and what's good for businesses. So with micro simulation that a lot of researchers and academics um, use, um, we're able to sort of think about different options and what the costs and benefits would be for different parts of society. I'm, I'm going to take one minute, because both those questions really engage me. I'm going to get out of my role for half for one moment. Um, first on unions, it really is worth thinking about that working on an auto assembly line or working in a steel plant did not necessarily look like a high quality job. But with unionization, that became job suddenly job. became one of the most desirable jobs because you got pay, benefits, health care, uh, often job training, other things that went with being a union member. And so the question is, in these a lot of service jobs, uh, which are not necessarily obviously quotes good jobs, can become good jobs. Right. And if you don't do it through unions, how else will you do it? And on the job guarantee, um, the um, Center for American Progress had a very interesting approach to this. Um, that focused on starting in, and you could define this in different ways, 
but they, they had a measure of economic distress and to take the 10% of the counties in the country, county may not be the ideal unit, they talk about that, but 10% of the counties or metros in the country that are at the bottom um, and focus on trying it in those places as a way to begin, which among <coughs> other things could be a way <coughs> to direct public investment and cash into areas sitting <coughs> at the bottom of the economy. I just thought that was one of the more I interesting iterations I have seen of the job guarantee. Yeah, there, uh, there are many complexities yeah, to the which job guarantee approach, including making sure that the wage set, the wages that are set, do not suppress the wages in the private sector and or suppress employment in the private sector. So it's a real balance, and the more that you know, labor policies and labor standards can be modernized to reflect the real world, then you may not need as many of the job guarantees if we improve some other aspects of public policy. Uh, anyone want to take Maureen's question or are these other questions, and then I want to get to- I want to, to take both questions. Oh. Yeah. All right, what, um, could I do this? Could you go, could you guys hold for a sec? I want to just get somebody in the audience and I'll go to you first when we get back. Go ahead, okay. Madam President. Stick um, with the promotion. So, <laughs> it was really rapid rise. In the, yeah. <laughs> so regarding you know, organized labor, um, I think these are very important conversations uh, to have, particularly right now, because organized labor um, is and remains critically important um, to ensuring that we are reminding our policymakers of how um, the nature of workforce and the relationship between the worker and the employer has changed and what needs to be um, retained. Um, but of equal importance, I think that we also need to have some real conversations um, with whether or not organized labor is really meeting the needs of all workers. And yeah. I think there is still some work that needs to be done, right? Um, when we talk about membership dues, when we talk about there still may be um, racial discrimination that exists um, within our union, um, within our union camps, um, but also there's a focus on, you know, apprenticeships, right? Mm -hmm. um, but remember, apprenticeships are employer-sponsored. You have to have the job first. Um, and so what is, what, what is, what is the appetite or interest around talking about incorporating pre-apprenticeship opportunities um, into um, a union model in a union space? And so when we talk about organized labor, yes, absolutely, still critically important um, and still has to lead the charge. But in, in 2019 and moving forward, we may have to look at how to rework the union model a bit to ensure that it's accommodating um, all the needs um, of the worker and the employer. Um, and to Maureen's question, um, you know, just how do we ensure that employers and policymakers um, are talking to each other and understand? I just want to be very, very clear that employers and policymakers are already talking to each other. Policymakers are actually listening more to businesses than they are the workers. And so I think what's important is that we need to have more workers and real stories um, a part of these conversations because um, then we get policies like, oh, we passed sick leave, but not for substitute teachers. Like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, oh, we're going to, you know, do minimum wage, but like half of the population is excluded from it and you can't get it until 2072 or something, right? <laughs> and so, like, how can we start, a a year. you know, yeah. like, how can we, you know, these conversations are happening in spaces where you have these policymakers, um, and I'm, I'm a policy wonk, I love policy, but I'm also a policy cynic because I spend a lot of time um, trying to convince, quite honestly, progressive um, policymakers to actually support the things that um, they claim and, and say that they support. Um, and many times it's because, um, yes, we have to partner with businesses. Businesses have to be in the room when we're talking about workforce development and aligning it with economic development. Absolutely important. Critically important to JOTF's work, right? I need you to hire low wage workers, right? And I need you to advance them to high wage jobs. But in order for you to do that, we have to engage so that I understand where you're coming from and you understand where I'm coming from. So that the solutions will ensure that you can maintain your bottom line, you can increase your profitability, but also the workers have access to good jobs that allow them opportunities for advancement. And then the policymakers end up looking good because they were just there in the background and they just introduced the bill and they're like, look, everybody's getting along, everyone's great. But that's not really happening right now. And you're just finding that the, the power is centered, at least in the state houses and in your local municipalities, 
um, you're finding that the business entities and the business groups are the ones that's really able to craft the workforce development policies. And then many of the worker groups or the advocacy organizations are just kind of left trying to fight for what's the least amount of harm that we can get out of something that actually started off as our idea that we brought to you, policymaker. And so um, I think you know there are a number of answers to your question, but I think it's just really, really important to make sure that we are providing a space for policymakers and businesses, but also workers to be in the room because we can't not have their voice if we're going to craft policies that's going to directly impact them and then say we did something because it's not cute. Thank you. I'm, I want to bring you guys in on this next round. Let's take uh, like two or three questions. We got uh, uh, the lady in the back right there and then these two folks over here and then I'll go to the other side of the room after. Please. Thanks. Hi. Uh, several of you mentioned that there are things happening at the state and local level as well. And I was wondering if any of you had an example of where um, a state and local policy is working for job retraining um, or for continuing adult education. Oh, that's a great question. Hang on. Uh, this gentleman over here and uh, then that gentleman. All right. Oh. Uh, thank you so much for the panel for coming. There's just some amazing ideas here. Uh, Two quick questions. Uh, what is the role of artificial intelligence automation oh. and uh, human rights in the future of labor? And in terms of innovation and economic growth, what can we learn from other nations outside of the United States, maybe in different points in history where they were successful? And what can we learn from the international sphere and international history? Well, you should teach a seminar. Those are such good questions. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, maybe you do. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Um, I, I operated at the uh, intersection of green jobs and climate policy mm -hmm. over the past decade. And uh, I, I'm involved with an organization, a green jobs training organization, veteran found that, that, that specializes in training for workers around wind, solar, weatherization, energy auditing, lead the green building standard on up to corporate sustainability. And back 10 years ago, when we were really coming up, what helped catapult that industry all around, not just us, was the ARA, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, yeah. right, under the yeah. Obama administration. And there was a lot of funding for that, but let's be honest, that helped, right? Uh, absent that kind of policy, do you see any sort of push within worker retraining or just worker training around green jobs training? absent a federal plop of money. Uh, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. So let me go to Amanda and Rick, um, and then somebody on, the, I, I love that question in the back with one state policy that makes, as you've seen, make a huge difference. The, the great uh, agenda the gentleman over here set, and then the green jobs, and then also anywhere you guys want to go. Go ahead. Yeah. And I'm a very permissive uh, moderator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you know, my focus has really been around small business. So I've done a lot of advocacy about creating um, loan programs, grant programs, so that we're, we're able to provide more money and know-how to small businesses so that they can grow. So it's a little bit different. A lot of what we're talking about, too, is workforce. But I think it, it does kind of merge the two areas. Um, in the state of Michigan, we there are funds that are provided. and. We try to do a lot of promotion around those so that they're, that, um, and we actually, just to step back for a minute, Northern Initiatives is also a manufacturing extension partnership. I think we're the only community development financial institution that also does that. And so our goal is to work with manufacturers to make them stronger um, so that they're sustainable, that they can create more jobs, um, and they really are higher paying jobs typically in our communities as well. Uh, so we partner with them a lot, utilizing the funds that MEDC has provided and with our, with our workforce board to be able to provide training to their employees too. And so there, there are funds that are provided through our state level. And then it just depends. Um, we've actually had some success with local community <laughs> foundations that are wanting to invest in, the, in their area. And so they've been helping to support what we've been doing so that we can get more small business startups and we can help more small businesses to start and grow and create jobs. And so we have a really concerted effort. So it's, it's not just 
state and local, but there's also, I'm finding these private foundations and community foundations that are getting involved. And so we actually have a concerted effort right now in Calhoun County, which is Battle Creek, Michigan, in the home of Kellogg, where we have put we've pulled together all of the resources and this is what i'm really excited for is it's the chamber of commerce it's the edc it's the workforce it's local nonprofits everybody has come together to think about how do we revitalize this community and make this a place where everybody wants to come and visit they want to work they want to live downtown um, and we're starting to see this is only we're about a year in and we're starting to see the efforts but what I want to just kind of why I'm saying these examples is we want to look at what we can do on the federal, state, local level, but then also look at what are the other players that are willing to support that work in our communities too. Rick? So with regard to uh, job retraining or workforce development, I like to think of it as shifting sands, right? I'm from the great state of New York and whatever we're doing today, it's probably going to be different in six months or next year. So we do try to take advantage of uh, workforce development grants when they're available to us. We tend to get between 20 and 50%, depending on the program and whether or not it's new employees or you know veteran employees that have been there for a while. Um, we estimate that we spend about 50,000 per employee in the first two years of their employment for training. So um, it's really important to us if they if they make it through that first two years We want to make sure they're really you know, they're in a role where they can be successful um, For our employees that are with us two years and longer our attrition is less than 5% We have a 95% retention rate at Optimax. So it's 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 an investment in workforce that pays off and, and the with the type of work that we do you know, we have highly skilled technicians and engineers, so you can't go out on the street and find people that know how to make precision optics the way we do. Um, even in a town like Rochester, uh, we have to train everyone we hire. And one other thing I was going to mention, too, when we think about advancing technology, you know, and, and people start to think, oh, that's going to replace our workers, um, our manufacturers are they're, they want people, and yes, it's a higher skill, but what they're doing, uh, we actually have, you know, there's manufacturing day, there's a day for everything, there's ice cream day, you know, but on manufacturing day, uh, we actually bring together local high schoolers and they're able to tour a manufacturing facility, learn about that so that they can start to think about what are some of those other opportunities. You don't have to go for a four-year degree, you can actually go through a skills training and get a really good job. And it's been really this partnership between those privately owned businesses, the, the local communities, as well as our local universities. And we've seen success. It, it just takes time. Um, and I think continued support for those efforts to think about how do we train people? Because we're, we're going to need the jobs. They just change. Uh, anybody, you want to, real quick, I, well, let's see, we're up. Can you hold, and then what I'd like to do is get this, a few questions on this side of the room. I saw some hands. Um, oh, Lord. Um, um, <laughs> how, questions how, are important. How, you, you, you can all ask 30 ask second questions, questions <laughs> and then we'll see what we do. Let's start in the back and work front there, 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 and there. And if you can be real quick. And maybe we can be indulged five minutes extra or something just to get you all in. Uh, uh, please. Hi. I uh, recently had the opportunity to go to West Virginia on a school trip. Um, and my question is about the regions of America that have kind of been left out of the successes of the 21st century economy, um, who seem to be suffering from inevitable forces like globalization and automation. Um, what do you think the government's role is in providing transition assistance for these folks? or providing them with new jobs as right. we undergo these massive shifts. Okay, good. Um, let's see, the next was uh, the woman in the back. Yes, there you go, on the other side of you. Oh, uh, <laughs> hi, uh, like a quick question and then a 20 second aside. So one thing I've never really <laughs> heard addressed in these spaces is relaunching, especially women like who before the, tw before the tw 2000s like took career breaks thinking that they would raise children and then for any reason um, extended career breaks after like high levels of education 
were um, left uh, now looking for a job and starting over from scratch. And at least from the state that I'm from, there are only, there's really only three things that exist. Relaunching um, support groups, which are really don't do anything for people who are looking for careers. Um, and then governor initiatives that seek to launch people of any path into um, technology. But there's not really any support system or any discussion for women who want to relaunch. Uh, let's see, uh, right here and then up here. Thanks. Hi. Thank you. I, th I think one of the most powerful messages from this conversation has been that it's not just wages, right? There are all of these aspects that are important to jobs and making quality jobs. At the same time, we know that wages have not kept pace with labor productivity. What is it going to take? What does the business community need to increase wages across the board, not just at the minimum wage level, but all the way up? Mm -hmm. all right. And then lastly, my friend here. Thank you. Thank you, Larry Checo. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, one, how would you react to a national service program mm -hmm. that incorporated apprenticeship programs, um, citizenship uh, education, uh, stipends while they're going to this, uh, through this process, right. and after a two-year uh, commitment, they Solid. would get something like a GI Bill. Right. Would that, would, do you feel that would be worthwhile? Yeah. Number two, to Rick, how do we get CEOs to understand that it's not just about growth, it's about shared growth. Mm -hmm. We all benefit when the ink, when and you are a perfect example. How can we replicate you? I mean, I I'm serious. No, no, I'm, I'm not joking. I mean, mm -hmm. he's starting a cloning company in a yeah. couple of years. But corporations are extremely ingenuous when they say we can't invest because there's no growth. There's no growth because people don't have money. Yeah. Come on, Henry yeah. Ford had this figured out 100 years ago. Give people a livable wage and they'll buy your products. You've learned that lesson. How do we pass that lesson on? You want to you wanna start? I, I thank you all, and I'm sorry if anybody else was left out. We'll, uh, why don't we start with uh, Rick cloning himself, and then we'll move up, uh, we'll move up the panel, and wow. you can close. I want to go to the question in the back about women that have, are, are bright but have taken time off for family. I, I uh, in addition to being CEO at Optimax, I'm vice chair of the local workforce investment board, and I think you know unemployment's really low in most places across the nation. I think this is a one of our best untapped potentials in in the workforce or in the community, is finding ways to help women create create little stepping stones to help them get back into the workforce. It's so intimidating if you've been out of the workplace for even five years to try to get back in because. The software has changed, the computers look different. It's, it's just really, really frightening for people to get back out of the workforce. For th thanks for the question, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know about cloning, but let's talk about it. <laughs> He's let's thinking talk, about it. Let's yeah, talk about we're, apprenticeships. We're let's talk, <laughs> so with regard to apprenticeships in our field, precision optics manufacturing, the last apprenticeship that was created was by Bausch & Lomb back around 1910. We looked at that one, it doesn't fit how manufacturing is done today. So we created a new apprenticeship at Optimax. It's been accredited at the state level and now at the federal level. And we're, as far as I know, we're the only optics company in the, in the nation with an apprenticeship program. But we are training people, it's a three year program and they, and they do get a, a certificate when they're done. Okay. Thank you. At Northern Initiatives, 30% of the customers we work with are women owned, um, small business owners. And when just thinking about um, that question, and, and of course, that's the one I went to right away because I work with a lot of small business owners. And so, you know, I manage the department that provides the knowledge piece of what we do. So they get the money, but then we work with them day in and day out to help them address the challenges that they're seeing. And a lot of these um, business, these women that we're working with, uh, they started a business because they also wanted some flexibility. It's not easy running a business, but they have, um, we've got a local retailer that her daughter will come to work with her and she's being able to see what is, what, she's able to see what her mom does every day and is getting really excited about at some point, you know, starting her own business. And so we're seeing that and we're supporting them. So entrepreneurship is always one path. It's not the path. Um, and I think when you think about like the question about apprenticeship, I think that would be great. But 
as you're hearing from all of us, we need a whole toolkit of resources. There's not just the one answer. And it, we all come at it from a different lens. Um, and it's about how do we bring those tools together so that they work, work together. Because I find in these communities, there's a lot of different efforts. And so I think my, my call to action is about, let's look at what is happening. What are the different efforts that are happening in our communities to support women, to support people that are re-entering or that are under-trained? And how do we all work together um, so that we have that cohesive? benefit. Good. Okay. A um, <clears throat> couple questions. Uh, so first, um, unemployment rate. One of my frustrations is when we talk about the low unemployment rate, one of the things that we don't do is we don't disaggregate the data. And so in Baltimore City, yes, the unemployment rate across the board is about 4 to 5 percent. However, for black residents, it's 14 percent. And so we can't really tout low unemployment rates in the city or in the state if you have a segment of the constituency that is significantly unemployed or underemployed. Um, when we talk about relaunching, um, everyone else is going to have much more compelling answers than me on this one. But I guess what I want to flag is something that we also need to make sure that we're talking about is ensuring that we are supporting and putting in place the policies that even allow women to want to be able to care for their families or care for themselves, right? And so this, of course, goes back to things like maternity leave or paternity leave and sick leave and paid family leave and all of these different things, um, right, that are going to facilitate you being able to make that decision and then having some sense of security while you are um, dealing and navigating through that decision. Uh, the question around the policies um, at the state level that could facilitate this. Number of issues, um, I'll throw out two uh, that's specific. One is specific to Maryland. Another is specific to and pertains to all of you. Um, in Maryland, <clears throat> if you had, uh, if you secured your GED, now in Maryland, once you secure your GED, you actually are not, you know, given a GED. You actually have the equivalent of a high school diploma. However, if you did not secure your high school diploma through traditional means, traditional means, you were ineligible to receive the largest pot of state financial aid. And so that totally stigmatized GED folks, right? Those individuals who may have obtained their GED while behind the fence, they may have you know, dropped out of school because you know, of an unplanned pregnancy, whatever. They did not obtain it the traditional way. And now they have lost access to the largest part of state financial aid, need-based financial aid. And it was one of those things where we just had to go to the policymakers and say, do you guys know what you're doing? And they were like, what? Why do we do that? I don't know you're the policymaker, so let's just pass it. So sometimes it really is just a matter of like reminding them about policies that are on the books that they probably don't even know exist. Um, and then let's take them off the books. The second one has to do with opportunity zones. Uh, opportunity zones, ladies and gentlemen, they are designated according to low income census tracts. So my mission is to help low wage workers advance to high wage jobs. So I have inserted myself in every conversation around opportunity zones to the chagrin of everyone else because they're not used to seeing the job opportunities task force because we're workforce. But if you are talking about operating businesses moving into low income communities, right, so that you can obtain these tax benefits, whether in the form of a delay or deferral or just forgiveness, right, in and of itself, then you better be talking about how you're going to ensure that the folks in my community that are making 10500 that those low-income individuals are moving into high-income opportunities. Because you guys are going to be making money, yet these folks are not. And if you move into my community and you don't have that pipeline of an educated, skilled workforce, what's going to happen? You're going to move your own workforce in, and then the residents are going to be priced out and moved out. So there are a lot that you can do at the local and state level around opportunity zones. Um, and then the last thing is just around employer education, employer education. Um, you know, many times we're having to engage the employers that hire from our pre-apprenticeship construction training program to get them to understand why they should support certain policies. And even though it's not sexy to have these behind the scenes um, conversations, we have to be clear about big P versus little p. Big P is your legislative, regulatory, statutory policy. Little p, which is of equal importance as big P, are those policies that were and conversations that we're having with the RICs of the world, or you know the trade associations and the other employers about. Let's talk about your hiring practices and let's talk about the policies that you have in place that provide supports and benefits, allowing an opportunity to build relationships and trust and safe spaces so that they can be able to do all of the things that you want them to do and need them to do. Amen. Uh, Thank you. I Demetra, just, you're I good. just want to uh, add a few points and try to respond to a couple of things. First, the 
woman in the back was asking for state examples. One state that we're watching is Kentucky, which is just developing a whole new policy around apprenticeship, pre-apprenticeship, mm -hmm. beginning in um, middle school and maybe even younger than that. So that's one that is also connected into the technical college system. So that's one to watch. The West Virginia example in national service, I could think up a policy, and maybe I'll do it tonight, um, that would combine those issues. But He's got a policy in case you didn't notice. She definitely <laughs> should talk to Larry. Certainly, <laughs> certainly the um, West Virginia would be the prime place for an economically targeted subsidized employment program, which could be linked into a national service program. So you could see that where it's triggered with um, unemployment or, um, or um, low income or chronic non-employment, which you could do at the same time. Uh, lessons from other countries, we've mentioned a few of them. I'll just summarize again. Uh, paid leave, um, apprenticeship at a much higher, more sophisticated level than we have, and job sharing. Those three things are things that we don't have here, other than health insurance, of course, we need that too. And um, role of automation, we need to be a little bit careful because um, certainly economists will always say, well, people, you know, the system adjusts, and so there aren't going to be that many, um, that many job losses. And in fact, in the, a lot of the research is showing that in the short term, there's going to be stimulus from either um, responses, adaptation to climate change and automation, uh, but it's in the long term is where you may see um, shifts and declines at the low end. And so we need to sort of combine uh, subsidies in that regard as well. And then I think there was one other point I wanted to make. Um, uh, green jobs and climate policy, um, federal money, yes, we need the federal money. Okay. And, um, and right now when the economy is strong, this is the time when we can get political, um, political support for encouraging that, but it has to be a long-term commitment, to 10, 20 years, not a short-term commitment. But the federal funding as a stimulus is very important. And I worked on the evaluation of the Recovery Act, so we know that there were some positive uh, capacity building that was developed at that point. And so the subsidies are important, and think about both short-term and long-term effects. And I know Maureen is eager to close, so yes. I just want to say two, uh, two of my favorite quotes in this general area. One is, we don't think enough about work as a community builder for all of us. And I still remember uh, something Robert Kennedy once said, and I'm paraphrasing, that the unemployed don't just have nothing to do. They have nothing to do with the rest of us. And I think it's very important to think about how participation in the workforce builds bonds between us. Uh, and we don't think about that enough. The other is uh, Pope Francis said that we don't shouldn't think of work as just doing something. It's a mission through which we cultivate and preserve creation. And he wasn't just arguing for green jobs, although that would uh, actually work. But I like the idea of work as a mission. So work is about productivity, yes, but it's also about creativity. And it's also about our everyday lives. And that's why I love what Maureen is doing. And I want to thank this awesome panel. And Rick, we're all going to go work for you. Yeah. <laughs> A big thanks to all of you for sticking with us. Job quality obviously is a big topic, lots of extra things to talk about. So um, we'll be back with more in our Working in America series to unpack this a little further. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>